and a very warm welcome to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. For those who don't know me, I'm Sabine Schmidtke, the permanent faculty at the School of Historical Studies representing Near Eastern Studies. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker of today. George Kieras is a senior research associate at IAS and the director of Beit Maputo, the Zurich Institute. He has written extensively on various topics and fields of Syriac. His latest output is a history of the Syriac community in North America and an edition of the Syriac English New Testament. Moreover, George is one of the early contributors to the digital humanities since the mid 80s. He has played an important role in the advancement of Syriac studies with respect to computing. Some of his DH initiatives include encoding Syriac music in 1984, introducing fonts for Near Eastern languages, including Aramaic, Ugaritic, cuneiform, and Egyptian hieroglyphics in 1986, producing textual tools for text alignment in 88 and concordances in 93, launch and launching one of the earliest peer-reviewed open access electronic journals and other important initiatives. Over the past five years, George and I have collaborated in convening a series of conferences on different aspects of Near and Middle Eastern manuscript cultures, um, with another one coming up in September on colophons in Near Eastern manuscripts. George will speak to us for about 60 minutes, and this will leave us some 30 minutes for discussion in the end. Please type your questions and comments by using the chat function, either during or after the presentation. Although this is a regular Zoom meeting, and in view of the large number of participants, I will read out the questions for George, rather than allowing participants to speak. And I would be really grateful if all attendees could mute themselves during George's talk. And please do note that today's talk is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on. Now, without further ado, I pass the floor to George. Thank you very much, Zabine, for these uh, kind words. And uh, I thank you for including me in this series. And also thanks to Maria at IAS and Uta at IAS. Uh, one, can, one could never hope for better colleagues at IAS. Uh, it's such a beautiful environment there. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, today we will be talking about the Syria New Testament, um, not from an Eastern uh, perspective in the sense that we're not talking about the manuscripts and the early and the textual criticism and and the history of the New Testament. We're really talking about it. Uh, uh, when, when it arrives in Europe. And that's the title of the book is about uh, early modern European humanism and the Syriac New Testament. What you see here on the screen is the first printed edition of the Syriac New Testament. And we're going to start with that. And then uh, we will spend probably about half of the talk on that and then we will talk about what happened after this edition uh, through the, the following two centuries. Now, as far as this particular edition, the first edition of the New Testament, we have two conflicting historical accounts behind it. We have the European account, which is also uh, the scholarly uh, tradition, which credits Johann Albrecht Wittmannstadt, who was a German humanist and a statesman, with this edition and with editing the text. And in fact, it is known uh, as the Wittmannstadt Bible. Uh, but there is a less known uh, Eastern story that comes from the Syriac tradition that credits this book or the publication Judge. of George, yes. one second. Could you please again share? Oh. We don't see your screen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about this. Sure, sure. Ah, uh, that's true. I I don't think I did share.
know about now. Perfect. Thank you. It's coming up. Yes, yes, yes. Let me just try to get the, uh, the laser pointer. There we go. So I'm just going to go to the first screen, which basically had the um, uh, had an image of the New Testament I am talking about. That's the first edition. And now I will go to the second street. So I'm uh, second screen. I'm already uh, talking about this one. The two stories. We have the Western story and the Eastern story. So the Eastern story credits the project to Patriarch Abdullah I. Uh, we don't know much about this Abdullah. We know that he was bo born in Qalatmara, which is a small village near Mardin. Now it's called Iskikale. Uh, we know the name of his father, Stephen. We know that he held a synod in 1519 in Sadad. Sadad, it's outside, outside of Homs. Some, some cousins wanted to get married and that created a hoopla. Some bishops uh, supported that and other bishops uh, didn't want that. So they had to hold the synod for it. Um, but we know that Abdullah heard of this new printing technology in Europe and thought of printing the, uh, the New Testament. So uh, printing was prohibited in the Ottoman Empire back in 1483. And of course, there would have been no, no print type in Syriac in the Ottoman Empire. So he sent off one of his students named Moshe or Moses, Moses of Mardin. Uh, Moshe is from a village called Sauro. Now it's called Savur. And Moshe took two manuscripts and went to Europe. Now, uh, let me just make sure I have, yes, my slides here. Um, so, so Musha took these manuscripts and went, went to Europe. So the Syriac story has Wittmannstadt as a facilitator. So usually if it's described in, in, uh, in Syriac sources, it's Bamadronuth with the help of, or if it's in Arabic, Bimusa'adat Bitmunstadt. And Moshe is the editor who edits the text. The Western story is the exact opposite. Bitmunstadt is the editor, and Moshe is one of many helpers who help in making the edition. Now we need to understand Moshe's trip to Italy in the context of the uh, geopolitics of the time. You know, the Ottomans are already on the doorstep, doorsteps of Vienna. That facilitated you know, the, the trip. Um, I grew up in the Syriac tradition myself. So when I was young, I was all in, always wondering, how the hell did he go from Mardin all the way to, 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 to Europe? But if, if, if we look if we at it from, from the perspective that the Ottomans you know, were already banging on the doors of, of Europe, we understand how the trip could, could become a bit, a bit easier. Now, uh, Moshe arrives in Rome in 1549. We know that because uh, he, he produces a manuscript there. Moshe is a scribe, a skillful scribe. And from the colophon, we know that he is already in Rome during that time. He meets there somebody called Andreas Maceos, who's a Catholic priest. Andreas already knows Arabic, basics of Arabic. Uh, Moshe helps him in, in advancing his Arabic and also teaches him Syriac. Moshe resides in the Ethiopian monastery of San Stefan in Rome. We know this from the colophon of him, his manuscript and we know that he studied some Latin there. Now, as for the printing of the New Testament, he didn't have much luck in Rome, although he got a bit of support in the beginning, financial support, but it wasn't sufficient. Uh, it seems maybe he had some problems there. He was offered reordination by the Catholic Church, which he refused, uh, claiming that uh, or, or, or stating that his ordination is fine. Um, so. So then he leaves Rome and he goes to Venice. Venice at the time is the Hollywood of printing, basically. So in Venice, he hopes to be able to find somebody to help him to, to print the book. 
Uh, in Venice, he meets Postel. Postel is a French linguist who already knew Syriac. Postel went to the Middle East uh, on, on his own, brought uh, a Syriac manuscript with him of the New Testament or maybe the Gospels. Uh, so he already kind of uh, was working uh, or hoping also to produce an edition. Uh, but in Venice, Musha was unable to find funding, a problem uh, we suffer from even today. Um, and he had basically to sit in, in Venice uh, waiting for an opportunity. So now let's move to the European story, which begins before Musha arrives in, in Europe. Uh, Wittmannstadt, uh, meets Teseo Ambrosio. Teseo Ambrosio is the first European, as far as we know, who learned Syriac. He was already an, an, an old man, um, uh, according to, 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 uh, to according to Wittmannstadt, he calls him the old man. Uh, he was in his 60s. Wittmannstadt was in his early 20s. Um, and uh, uh, Ambrosio teaches Wittmannstadt Syriac. Ambrosio had learned it himself from Maronites who, uh, a bit earlier who went to, to attend the Lateran Council in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, so he teaches Wittmannstadt Syriac and according to Wittmannstadt, the old man charges him with printing the New Testament in the language hollowed by the lips of Christ. And this is an important phrase uh, that we, we see it repeated with the early humanists, uh, viewing Syriac as a holy language uh, with, with some mystic features. And we will talk about that a bit later. Wittmannstadt continues to learn Syriac. Uh, other Maronites later on also help him. And there is some evidence that he may have read the Syriac grammar of Barabroyo. Barabroyo is a 13th century polymath who wrote a detailed grammar of Syriac. There is some annotations in a manuscript. It's possible that Wittmannstadt read that text. Four years later, Wittmannstadt finds a second gospel manuscript. So, so, uh, so Teseo gave him a manuscript basically of the gospel when he charged him to, to print the text or to publish the text. Uh, Wittmannstadt finds a second manuscript in Siena. He copies it and, and most likely he, he collates it against the manuscript that he has. Uh, now, this is before Mushi arrived to Europe. Also, Wittmannstadt goes to the Hollywood of printing, goes to Venice, uh, try to find somebody willing to take on the project, but but uh, there was no success. Uh, Wittmannstadt becomes a diplomat, a, a, success, a very successful one. He becomes a secretary at the courts of cardinals and princes and moves up, moves up in the world and ends up in the court of Ferdinand, a prince at the time, but who would later become the emperor. So he has a very successful diplomatic career. Now, back to Moshe being stuck in, in Venice, trying to figure out a way to print a book. Uh, uh, Postel knew about Wittmannstadt and, and his plans. So most likely it is Postel who advised Moshe that if you wanna do this, you need to talk to Wittmannstadt. But how to talk to Wittmannstadt? Wittmannstadt is in, in Germany. Uh, the, the roads are not, are not safe. So how do you get from Venice to, to Germany? Enter Mary Tudor. Uh, when she ascended, the crown, the, 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 the ascended to the throne in England in 1553, her cousin, uh, Paul, uh, Reginald Paul, uh, was in exile uh, and the Pope sent him back to Mary in order to support her against the Protestants. Uh, Paul was at Lago de Garda, not too far uh, from, from Venice. 
and somehow Whitman Strat, uh, sorry, Moshe, Moshe may have heard uh, the, of, of this trip, and uh, he applied to join uh, uh, the trip. And he must have had letters of recommendation, maybe uh, uh, maybe Postel helped him, maybe he wrote to Maceos and Maceos helped him, uh, but he managed to, to hop on Paul's train. But unknown to, to Moshe and unknown to Paul, Wittmannstadt is no longer is in, in, is in his hometown. Uh, some, some, some local war is taking place and Wittmannstadt decides to go to Vienna and then these two caravans, so to speak, are, are going against each other. But somehow, according to the writer of the Church Quarterly Review, you see a quote there, by a miracle or by divine providence, I think that's his words, the two accidentally, these two, two caravans meet in Dillingen in Germany. Um, and here there is a nice paragraph describing this from the Church Quarterly Re Review. Here, therefore, it is probably it's probable these two men met, the Syrian priest and the German statesman, bent on a common object, which to the latter had been the, the hope of half of his lifetime, and to the former was the discharge of a trust which had sent him out of the heart of Asia into the heart of Europe, across the sea, from the east to Italy, across the Alps, from Italy to Germany. So now, you can imagine uh, how pleased Wittmannstadt and Moshe were with, with each other. And uh, they both, Wittmannstadt basically takes Moshe with him to Germany. In, uh, in to, sorry, to Vienna. In Vienna, the project is presented to, to, to the prince who would later become the, the, uh, the emperor. And he decides to underwrite the project. So now the project is feasible and they get Postel uh, from, from Venice to help out, help out as well. So what, what we know is that uh, Postel's, uh, Postel mostly uh, helped in designing the, the, the print type based on the handwriting of Moshe. But Postel probably had also a lot of editorial contribution. Later on, he complains that, that he is not given due credit in Wittmannstadt's uh, introduction uh, to, to, the, to, to the edition. Uh, but now you have a collaboration between the three. At some point, Postel has, has some problems. Uh, I think he's accused of, uh, of leanings toward Protestant or something along those lines, and he has to leave Vienna. So then Wittmannstadt and Moshe go on. Now, it's important to look at this timeline. Uh, it will help us reconstruct, uh, you know, what happened and, 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 and maybe, maybe who was the lead editor of, of this work. Now, when did, when did Wittmannstadt and Moshe meet? Well, we don't know exactly when they met, but we know that Paul landed in Dover in November, 1554. That means the meeting in Germany must have taken place in October, maybe in September, or maybe a bit earlier, but not in the beginning of 54. I don't think Paul was sitting in Germany smoking hookah uh, and, and spending time there. He probably just wanted to go on and, and uh, get to his destination. Now, we know from colophons of the book that, that Matthew was completed in February 14th. Mark was completed in March 21st of, 19, of not 1955, in 1555. Uh, and you could see how rapidly this project is working. It is going on. It's only a matter of months. By August, the whole thing is done. So John is done in, on May 18th, uh, uh, July 18th for, uh, for, for the Pauline epistles, August 14th for Acts. If, if you do some cross multiplications on word counts, you can postulate that printing must have begun or production must have begun in the first or at most 
the second week of January of 1555. So there isn't much of a time between, between it's only a matter of months between when they met and when work had begun. So now I'm going to be arguing that Mushe had more of a leading role as the editor, if not the almost sole editor of this work. So my arguments go as, as, well, as follow. First of all, let's look at Wittgenstadt before, before Mushe and what, what he's done already. Well, we don't know exactly the, the exact, the, the actual work, but we know that he only had access to two gospel manuscripts. Uh, there, we didn't have that much of Syriac text available in the form of manuscripts in Europe. Wittmannstadt only comes across the text of the Pauline epistles and acts few months only before the work starts. That's when Mushe brings the text. This brings to question Mushe's abilities to edit this text. If you've studied Syriac and you're exposed only to the gospels, which are narratives, the acts may not be a big of a problem for you, but Pauline epistles will be a problem. It's a different type of text. Uh, it's a different type of vocabulary. It's a different type of constructions. Would few months be sufficient for you to be able to do an edition of the text? So that, that brings that to a question. On the other hand, Musha is a natural. He grew up with this text and he, he, he knows it from, from the back of his mind. The second argument comes from Colophons and Sebastian Brock, who I understand is with us here in this meeting, already wrote a paper in 1994 where he talks about these colophons. Uh, at the end of the Gospels, uh, there, there is this big colophon or large, large colophon, uh, and all this yellow area here is about Moshe, where he came from, and it is through him, through his, through his work, Mas'a'u Youth in Syria, that this work is done. And with the help, Obama Adro Nuthu here, and with the help of Wittmannstadt. And all of these are nice adjectives describing, describing Wittmannstadt. But Moshe in this colophon gives himself the, uh, well, he, he, his name occurs first. And, and he's giving himself the credit. As Sebastian Brock already noted, it looks like maybe Wittmannstadt noticed this and complained. So the colophon after the Pauline epistles is the opposite. It starts with mentioning Wittmannstadt and all of this is about Wittmannstadt, nice adjectives, even mentioning his wife and, and his children and uh, 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 here, yeah, Barbara. <laughs> uh, and then at the end, pray for me, I Moses. And very important, only four words. I labored so much in these books. So here we also have an indication uh, that Moshe himself tell, telling us uh, that he's done that. Uh, there is also another errata, kind of a, the, the intro to, to the errata. Uh, Moshe, or the writer, obviously Moshe, tells us, uh, no, my brother, that I went um, over this text and I saw many mistakes and I fixed them and I did this. It's all in the first person. I did this, I did that, I corrected. Uh, and I ask of you to, to pray for my weak person, not, not, not our weak person. So this is all this is all Moshe. Now, had Witt Wittmannstadt being quite active and being in the, driver, the driver's seat, he would have noticed these as they were going to the, to the printer. Uh, but it seems that, that, you know, all the gospels, this errata, which comes, with, which was printed at the beginning, it seems at least it's bound at the beginning. Uh, it may have got, got, gotten printed at the end. Uh, all of this happened before Moshe, uh, or sorry, before Wittmannstadt noticed this. The, the third argument that um, 
I would like to make, which actually Wittmannstadt tells us himself uh, in his introduction, is that you know I did all of this, but I was so busy with all my work, I could only go uh, after I finished my work and at the court to do all this work. Well, if you're fin if you're working all day at the court, how much can you do? And Wittmannstadt has done a lot for the project. There are. 100, about 100 pages of Latin. This is not Mush's work in terms of introduction, in terms of some annotations. Uh, there are also a number of illustrations uh, and there's, there's the general management. I'm sure it was Wittmannstadt, he had to be responsible on, on managing the project, who's going to, to, to be paid and what and when and, and, and so on and so forth. With this very short period of time, and you're only working after hours, and you're producing all this Latin stuff, how much work can you really be giving to the Syriac text? The fourth argument is the order of the books. The books are published, the Gospels first, then Paul, then Acts. This is an indication uh, of uh, uh, of the text being printed for liturgical use. Uh, it is clear that by that time, the reading of Acts in the Holy Liturgy has fallen out. In fact, it, it, it fell out uh, until very recently, it was restored in the United States about 10 years ago or so. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, I grew up in the tradition when I was a kid, Acts was never, was never read. Uh, as part of the lectionary. So it is more of an appendix uh, in, in, in the book. But all publications, uh, uh, subsequent publications of the Syriac Bible by, by the European humanists, they follow the Western book order. Acts would come after the Gospels. The fourth argument is the presentation. If you look at the page, it resembles a manuscript, a product by a scribe. Later on, we're going to see the the uh, this, the next edition of the of the Syriac text, and you will see it very differently. There are verse numbers, there are indices to footnotes or marginal notes. There are titles, there are subtitles. Uh, this 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 resembles. This is closer to a manuscript than to to a European printed book. And the sixth argument is the accuracy of the text. The text is quite accurate. Um, if we look at uh, the edition, the subsequent editions that were done in Europe, although most of them, they were based on this text, you will find far more mistakes. If we also are to compare the publishing of Syriac with the publishing of Arabic and Ethiopic uh, texts, in Europe, at the beginning of this period, obviously, uh, the, 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 the both Ethiopic and Arabic also had so many errors and, and so many mistakes. It's only once you get to the 1700s where you start seeing uh, text editions in Europe uh, that, that are quite accurate. And we will see uh, later on when we talk about the move from the early humanists to the, to the philologists of the subsequent centuries. Um, so, so these are the arguments that I'm giving that most likely Moshe was, if not the sole person responsible, he was the lead in this project. Postel claims also that he's done some work and, and he must have because he worked on, on the text for a long time and Postel also complains that nobody is giving me credit for my part of, of the project. Uh, just on, on, a, on a side note, Wittmannstadt also published uh, a prima elementa, uh, a kind of a primer for the Syriac language. And sometimes it, it was bound with the, uh, with the New Testament. Basically it was the alphabet with Latin transcription uh, and then some practices of syllables and words. And then there are texts. 
and the text come with Latin transliteration. And I can't remember if there's translation. I don't think so. I don't have it in, in front of me. Um, it is also uh, good to point out that the texts that is the Christomathy, let's say, not properly Christomathy, but the, 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 the texts that are provided as practice most likely are, are all provided by, uh, by Moshe, or I, I would say 100% by Moshe. And this is if we look at the content of these texts. These are all liturgical. It begins with a qawmo, which consists of the Sanctus, the Qadish, the Trisagion, the Qadish of Aloho, the Lord's Prayer. And very important, the Lord's Prayer follows the liturgical tradition, forgive us our debts and offenses. You will not find this in the gospel manuscripts. This is only known from the liturgical tradition. Then there's the Ava Maria, which is also the Mawarbo, which is from the liturgical tradition. The Shuboho, uh, basically a phrase that says praise to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, uh, is from the liturgical tradition. And there is a prayer which is the longest of all of them. It comes to a few pages, al Atro. Uh, that's the last one on my list. Also a liturgical one. And it would be impossible for anyone outside of the church to know them because they're not written anywhere. I haven't found them, uh, and I'll be interested to know if any manuscript contains them. Usually these are taught orally. Um, uh, of course, they are published uh, now uh, after the age of printing, but during the manuscript tradition, uh, we don't know of, of, of their existence in that form. So they, they, they could only come from the head of Moshe. Now, the Wittmannstadt Bible was a huge success. The New Testament scholar Eberhard Nessel of the 19th century calls it the best edition to date, obviously the best Syriac edition to date. It was reprinted many times, and we will talk a bit about that uh, later on. Uh, how are we doing? We're doing fine with time. Um, and it was mentioned in the King James Bible in the 1611 edition, uh, where it's quoted there, it is in all learned men's libraries. Uh, and more, more importantly, the text in the 1555 edition is the base of all subsequent texts uh, until the 19th century when we start getting uh, uh, into the business of textual criticism. So uh, what happened uh, basically uh, after the 1555 Bible and more importantly, why are these European humanists interested in, in Syriac? There are two monographs by Wilkinson on, on the topic. Uh, we saw how Wittmannstadt saw Syriac as, the, as a sacred language. It is the language, it's the language of Christ. And there is evidence also that the early humanists saw an aura of mysticism around the Syriac alphabet. The letter Olaf, which is this one, the, Al the Alaf, it has one, two, three strokes, denotes the Trinity. The Beth next to Alaf here is the firstborn of the Alaf. It, it's a Kabbalah type uh, kind of uh, type of a cult maybe. Uh, so that is one of the motivations. Uh, another motivation was uh, the hope that through the, uh, the Syriac, you could convert Jews and Muslims. Uh, they thought that, well, Syriac is so close to Hebrew, you could just give it to a Jewish person and they can read it and, and you could easily get converts that way. Uh, and the same thing with, with Arabic. Uh, th th there is, of course, now communication with the Ottoman uh, Empire. Uh, Empire. And, and there was hope that maybe uh, through Syriac, you could just give it to somebody who reads Arabic and they can just read it and, 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 and it is, it, it, it's no problem. Um, now, the, the, sec the next edition, in fact, um, uh, that, that came out, it came out in uh, 
1569 by Emmanuel Tremilius himself, an Italian Jew, Jewish person who converted to Christianity. He was the Hebrew professor at Heidelberg. He had access to one more manuscript, so he did some, some work and some collation. Notice the difference between this and the Wittmannstadt Bible. Uh, you've got verse numbers, you've got marginal notes, uh, you've, you've got headings, you've got runners, you've got all of, of this stuff that gives you the, the, a, a different feel than the, uh, than the Wittmannstadt uh, Bible. Uh, this is all Syriac in the Hebrew script. Sometimes uh, uh, the text was printed in the Hebrew script because of a lack of print type, but sometimes there was, we know that there was Syriac print type in that particular press, but yet it was printed in the Hebrew script. That feeds into the notion of maybe it was done to make, to make the, 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 the text accessible to Jewish readers. Uh, so a possibility. Um, now, one interesting thing is that, uh, is that Tremelius changed the text, the morphology of the text uh, uh, to, match, uh, to match biblical Aramaic uh, rather, than, rather than Syriac. Syriac is the only, is the only uh, kind of language of the, of the Aramaic family where the imperfect has the prefix na, n, instead of ya. So instead of yaktub, it's naktub. And you could see here all the yuds. The first letter here is a dab because that's a prefix, but then there's a ya after it. The under it here, there's a ya. All of these would be n in the Syriac text. So this is systematic throughout the edition. It is changed into, uh, into a ya. Um, also, the text of, uh, that Musha did is partially vocalized with two systems of vocalization. There is a dotting vocalization and there is symbols. The symbols are borrowed from Greek. The symbols are usually a feature of West Syria. Only West Syria uses the, the symbols, but the dotting system is, is the kind of the shirt system uh, 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 both in East and, and West. So it's a hybrid system in, uh, in Moshe's text, uh, but partial partially vocalized. Nobody fully vocalizes because people, people basically know how to read. This text is fully vocalized. And whenever, if you compare this text with Moshe, whenever Moshe gives vocalization, it is accurate here. But in places where it's partially vocalized with Moshe, there are no vowels. Uh, there are qu quite a good number of mistakes in uh, Tremelius' text. And that takes us to back, you know, to the to the argument of accuracy. Also, Tremilius is, is the first uh, to start adding to the text. The Peshitta Syriac New Testament does not correspond completely to the to the Greek New Testament. So, in one John five seven, the comma Johannium is not there. So, Tremilius translates it, translates this 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 portion from Latin, from the Vulgate, and, and puts it in, in Syriac. Next, Syriac appears in the Antwerp uh, polyglot, uh, also called the King's Bible, the king being Philip II of Spain. Uh, Syriac is in volume five in the Syriac script here, and you can, you can see it, partially vocalized. And the editor uh, is called Guy, a French pupil of Postel. And this text was reproduced after this edition three times in the Hebrew in Hebrew letters. But uh, something to note in Guy's introduction, the Syriacs in making the shapes of their letters trace the holy mystic shape of the cross in memory of him who lifted up upon it, stretched out his hands and drew all the ages unto him. You see this mysticism, this, 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 uh, 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 feeling towards the Syriac letters and the Syriac alphabet. Then comes the uh, Nuremberg polyglot. Uh, the editor is Elias Hunter. And here you also see the Syriac in the first column here. 
And you may think this is Hebrew, but this is all Syriac. Evangelion, Dematai, and then here you've got the Ka for Ktaba, Ktobo, the, the, the book. So Ktobo, Diliduthe, Yeshu, Amshi, Hobret, David, Breda, Prohom, or, uh, or bar, dab, bar Breda, Prohom. That's, that's a variant reading. Um, I didn't check the vocalization to see to see accuracy whether he, he they relied on Tremilius or other things. I didn't check that on this particular editions. But by the end of the 16th century, there were nine printings or nine, nine editions within a span of 45 years only. Remember, the first edition is 1555, so the first half of the century, nothing took place. So you've got nine printings in the half of the 16th century. Then we move to the 17th and the 18th century, and here we see the bit of a shift in the intellectual environment in Europe. Uh, so basically in the 16th century, people are dabbling with, with, the, with the languages, with, with, with Syriac, with Arabic, with Ethiopia, Ethiopic. Uh, they're writing some grammars, they're writing some dictionaries. Uh, Harvard even required Aramaic and Syriac from all its sons. Uh, which I find weird, but, but uh, that's what Turner in philology, philology tells us. Uh, during the 17th century, we, we, we begin to see erudition. We begin to see philology closer to what, what, what we understand it as, as philology. Uh, we, we see a move away from Syriac, the sacred tongue and the mystic shapes of the letters to, towards a, a genuine philological interest in the language and, and in the text. And also there's a bit moving away from this business of let's convert the Jews and the Muslims through the Syriac gospel. Um, so it is kind of the beginning of, of textual criticism, although that doesn't really take into shape until a bit, a bit later. And also in this period, we see the interest of the European uh, humanists in the non Peshitta books. So let's just take a break and look at the history of the Syriac Bible. This is the Peshitta. This is the kind of the Vulgata of the, of, of, of the Syriac church. But also there, there is the Harklian, which is uh, a a, 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 which is a translation from the Greek, rather. I mean, uh, a tra translation from, uh, uh, yes, I mean, from the Greek, but later on in order to make the text closer and closer to the Greek. So now, now the, the scholars are interested in the Harklian. They're also interested in sixth century uh, books of the New Testament that are not part of the Pshitta. Revelation is not part of the Pshitta. In fact, the 1555 Bible does not have uh, Revelation. It does not have the minor general epistles to Peter, to and third John, Jude. They don't exist in the Pshitta. So they, they, they were never published. And Wittmannstadt inquired about them. He said, Moshe, why are these books not here? Moshe assured him, we have them in the Middle East. They're just not with me because he brought a Pshitta manuscript. He didn't bring these, these other manuscripts that would have, would have these texts from, from the Herculean and other sixth century man, uh, translations. So now the philologists are in, interested in that. In 1612, there is a mention of them, not, not the text, but a mention of them in Latin, that they do exist in Syriac. In 1627, we, we have the first edition of Revelation, based on the Harklian on here, because it doesn't exist in the Pshita. And then 1630, we have the first edition of the minor uh, epistles. And then Syriac appears in both the Paris polyglot and in the London polyglot. And now you have not only the Pshita, but you have also these other texts that you can include. In 1664, Gutenberg publishes for the very first time the entire New Testament. This, in the sense, entire in the sense of, of it includes uh, Revelation and the minor epistles. Also, the 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 story of the adulterous woman. That's also not part of the Pshita. 
So all of this work is the work of the European humanists. In 1703, apart from, let me go back, apart from the Paris polyglot, Asimani, who is a Maronite, uh, is involved in the editorial work uh, of, of the text. Uh, now to 1703, we have an edition made for the Easterners. Basically, it's made for the Maronites. It is a bilingual uh, liturgical uh, lectionary, although the text is according to the uh, canonical books. Uh, but it, clearly, it has all the liturgical readings, so it's meant for liturgical use. It's in two columns, one in Syriac, one in Garshuni, Arabic in the Syriac uh, alphabet. And the editor is Merhej Makhlouf, uh, who is from, from Lebanon. There is partial vocalization there also, but now we have the beginning of a new tradition. This is the very first time where there is an exclusive use of the symbol vowels, the Greek, the so-called Greek vowels, not the dotted vowels. There's not a single dotted vowel. And today you look at uh, all the New Testament editions and you see them all in, in these types of symbol vowels, fully vocalized. You, you will not find that in manuscripts. That's not really the early Syriac tradition. It is from this 1703 edition that we begin to see uh, this business of let's vocalize only with the Greek vowels. And later on, uh, it is only later on that we get full vocalization, much later on. Uh, in 1703, we have critical edition in quotes, semi-critical edition by Scha. Uh, it's an important one for the history of printing. It is the first known book to be printed using cliche. You have a picture here. Usually they used to set the letters, one letter after the next, and then you know press the paper against it. And, uh, and that's it, the, the book is printed. If two years later you wanted to print the book, you go back and you typeset every single page. So if you look at two editions of books, they will never be exactly the same. And somebody came up with the idea, okay, once I put all the letters next to each other, let me make a mold of the whole page. So they made a mold of the whole page, and then you could take this mold, because now it's a negative, right? I mean, well, the letters are negative, now it's a positive, you could read it. Now you need a negative to, to print on. So from this mold, they would create one metal plate uh, of the entire page, and they would press the paper against that. The, the advantage is that this metal plate can survive for centuries. So 50 years later, you want to print the book again, you don't have to typeset again, unless there is a typo that you want to fix, and then you have a bit of a problem. You have to typeset, typeset the whole page. Uh, so you could just use these cliches, and you can, in fact, sell them. They, they, they get sold from one printer to the next. So back to the New Testament from printing. Uh, in 1767, we have another Eastern project, the Chaldeans, and the Chaldeans are an offshoot of the Church of the East. They're the Catholic counterpart of the Church of the East. Uh, we also have a, a bilingual le lectionary, uh, um, but this is the first time where uh, the text is in East Syriac. And the appearance of West Syriac initially by Moshe and by the Maronites, that's what kind of made the Serto script, the de facto script among, in, in scholarship uh, until, until many centuries later. It is only with the publication of two major series, the CSCO, and then the Patriologa Orientalis, and then again in the middle of the Patriologa Orientalis, we see a shift to Estrangula, which is the oldest of the script that none of the communities, neither the East nor the West Syriac communities use it for main texts. They only use it for headers and for decorations. Um, and that, that's why most of our grammars and most of our, uh, our lexica are all in the Serto Certo script is because of this history. And towards the end of the 18th century, Joseph White publishes this Harclean text. Let's go back this, the entirety of this Harclean text here. 
uh, sorry, this Hagian text here, but he thinks it is the Felixonian version, which is lost. So the book tells us it's the Felixonian, but in fact, it is the Harclean text. Uh, so by the end of the 18th century, we have 24 editions of the Syriac New Testament, but from that time, about 100 years will pass. About 100 years will pass until Western scholarship uh, gives the Syriac New Testament scholarly attention. Uh, and that would be then uh, the, the, mostly the work of missionaries, both Catholic and Protestant missionaries. Uh, and with, with that comes further stories of Orientalism, but these are stories for another day. Thank you so much for listening.